Hello everybody, welcome back to Da Vinci Academy's Chapter 7 of Hedonac. Here we're going to discuss the Infratemporal Fossa in our Lecture 6. So this is a very short chapter, it's not that long, but there's a lot of high yield clinical relationships that are probably very important to know, especially in head and neck. So the Infratemporal Fossa, also called the IT Fossa, is a region that's located deep into the face. It's actually a very important part of the face that's actually located right underneath the zygomatic arch. If you can imagine if this was a zygomatic arch right here and then the masseter muscle itself. So again, this is the sending ramus of the, ma of the mandible, and then you would have your masseter kind of projecting up like this, pretty much obscuring this infratemporal fossa. So again, if you were to remove this masseter muscle and remove this zygomatic arch, then, you have, then you're pretty much in the infratemporal fossa. So this is a very complex, very small region of the, of the face that's important for facial vascularization, a lot of masticatory muscle importance, as well as autonomic, sensory, and motor innervation functions as well. So we're going to discuss a lot of the infratemporal fossa relationships, their bony relationships at first, just because it's just give you a picture of what's going on here. So again, there's a lot of neighboring structures, whether it's bony structures, muscular structures, nervous, arterial structures, but the bony structures are pretty much composed of an anteriorly located maxilla right here. You have a posterior carotid sheath that actually will run, will run up with the ascending ramus of the mandible. Then you have the medial portion is a lateral pterygoid plate, which is hard to see. Um, it'd be really far in here as a plate somewhere in here where the muscles are attaching to, um, like that. Laterally, you have the ascending ramus of the mandible right here that's been removed in this image. Your floor is the medial pterygoid muscle, and then your roof is the sphenoid bone itself, the, the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. So again, roof, floor, and that's how it works. So your neighboring fossas, this is very important because a lot of these terms can get very confusing, especially when they start sharing the same words. So the first one is the pterygopalatine fossa. So pterygopalatine fossa, or the PT fossa, is, will be discussed in the next chapter. We're going to introduce it right here. So the IT fossa, as we discussed, is deep to the zygomatic arch. It's also deep to the ascending ramus and the masseter muscle. And what's also important is that it terminates, there's a termination point called the PT fossa. This little PT fossa, as you can imagine, is this little triangle, this little diamond-shaped image I'm drawing right here. Deep into here is this little small little pocket called the PT fossa. And that's where there's a lot of neurovascular structures that are coursing its way through to the deep nose, even into the brain itself. So it's very important to know its relationship in, in, in regards to the infratemporal fossa. But it's also important to know that there's an entranceway called the pterygo maxillary fissure. And this is often very confusing for a lot of students, especially when they're first coming across this. But let's just break it down. Your pterygo comes from your pterygoid plates, which is located deep in here. And where they meet up with the maxillary bone, the maxilla right here, it forms the pterygo maxillary fissure. And that's all it is. It's a pterygo maxillary fissure, just an entrance way into the PT fossa from the IT fossa. Then you have your supratemporal fossa, which again is this region right here. This is above the zygomatic arch. And this contains a lot of very important structures, but however, clinically, not too much though. But here, anyway, contains a temporalis muscle, which comes down like this and attaches for muscle mastications movement. You have your deep temporal artery, you have your superficial temporal artery, you have your zygomatic and auricular temporal, which are both just sensory nerves. Next, you have your foramenal valley, which is a, a frame that's located in your sphenoid bone, the greater wing of your sphenoid bone that actually has importance for the passageway of three structures, your cranial nerve V3, as well as your lesser protrusal nerve, and your accessory meningeal artery, which if you remember from the vasculature of the head and neck, this is a little artery that actually comes off of the first segment of the maxillary artery. Then next you have your foramen spinosum, and this foramen spinosum is entrance way for the middle meningeal artery itself, which is, again comes off of the first segment of the maxillary artery. So now we're going to talk about the infratemporal fossa contents. So the infratemporal fossa is pretty much just an entranceway, a passageway, a conduit for a lot of neurovascular structures as it coming from the central nervous system, for a lot of cranial nerves, or a lot of the arterial systems going up into the deep face of the brain itself. So it pretty much is a pretty much like a highway to the deep face, to the maxilla mandible, and to the oral cavity. So the PT fossa has a host of many different nerves that provide innervation to the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, the maxillary structures, and the mandibular structures. The first one we're going to discuss is the otic ganglion. So the otic ganglion is a primary parasympathetic ganglion that provides the site of synapses for parotid innervation for salivation purposes. The nerve fibers from the otic ganglion run along with the auriculotemporal nerve on their way to innervating the parotid gland itself. This pretty much just hijacks along the auriculotemporal nerve. 
Next is the chorda tympani, and this is a branch off cranial nerve 7. This is important because it provides taste sensation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The posterior one-third of the tongue is provided by the glossopharyngeal cranial nerve 9. This chorda tympani is actually a nerve that runs or hijacks its pathway uh, along the lingual nerve as it enters into the oral cavity. This one also contains parasympathetic fibers that synapse on the submandibular ganglion. Next, you have the auricular temporal nerve, which is a branch off of cranial nerve D3. It, this one runs with a superficial temporal artery as it runs up to provide innervation to the, the ear and the temporal region. It's also important because it actually forms a loop, as you can see right here, a little, a little loop around the middle meningeal artery, which is very important because it's often loved to be tested upon in, in cadaveric dissections because of the fact that it forms this very unique uh, wrapping around the middle meningeal. It provides sensation to the external ear, the external acoustic meatus, the external tympanic membrane, and the superficial temporal region. Again, two important clinical relationships that you must know is that it wraps around the middle meningeal and actually also passes between the mandibular and the sphenomandibular ligament. Then you have your buccal nerve, which is a branch of V3. This one runs behind the heads of the lateral pterygoid, underneath the temporalis muscle and the masseter, but eventually will, will run with the buccal branch of, of cranial nerve 7. It provides a majority of innervation to the lateral pterygoid muscle and the sensory to the cheek and also provides uh, sensation to the second and third molar buccal mucosal surface. So it has a lot of different regions of, of innervation, um, both sensory and motor. It is often confused with the buccal branch of cranial nerve 7, however it has no functions with the facial muscles of facial expression. Then you have your lingual nerve that also passes through the infratemporal fossa. It's again a branch off of cranial nerve V3, the mandibular nerve. Uh, it runs with the inferior alveolar nerve proximally, but then splits off and to go into the tongue itself. And you can see it's very small uh, in this kind of window here, but then it branches off and goes off and into the tongue. Uh, diverges anteriorly immediately, along with that corded tympani, as we mentioned before, to provide uh, innervation to the tongue. It passes between the mandible and the medial pterygoid. It passes under the superior pharyngeal constrictor and the styloglossus. It's just a very, very complex traffic for this, for this nerve. It also passes between the hyoglossus and the submandibular gland and then enters the tongue and becomes a sublingual nerve. Again, in terms of how important are you ever going to be tested upon and how this actually passes through the face, probably not. I mean, this is probably one of those nerves that loves to be tested on in a gross anatomy because it's just a hard nerve to find, it's a hard nerve to locate, but you're probably just going to have to remember something simple, like it runs with the runs with the corded tympani, it's from V3, it runs with the inferior alveolar nerve proximally, uh, it helps with providing sensation to anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So. Then you have the inferior alveolar nerve. This is probably, again, probably one of your big guns coming off the infratemporal fossa. It's loved to be tested upon because of the fact that it has such an important relationship with the mandibular canal. It runs posterior to the lateral pterygoid muscle. It branches off and gives off the mylohyal nerve, which then enters the mandibular foramen. It provides sensation to the mandibular teeth, as you can see here, and eventually will actually exit right here as the mental, mental nerve to provide sensation to the to lower chin and, and uh, medial lip, lower chin area. Um, the mylohyoid nerve is just a nerve that branches off of the inferior alveolar nerve, as you can see right here. This is the branch off, off of the inferior alveolar nerve called the mylohyoid nerve that provides muscle innervation to the mylohyoid and the anterior belly of the digastric. So again, real quick, we talked about this in the vasculature of the head and neck. The ECA will eventually terminate as a superficial temporal artery, which ascends to provide blood to, these, to, to the superficial scalp. Um, but it also has importance because the ECA will actually uh, give off the branch like the maxillary artery in the infratemporal fossa and then based on the lateral pterygoid muscle in this infratemporal fossa region you will actually have its the defini the definitions or divisions of the maxillary artery. So when we talk about the infratemporal fossa there's actually important muscles that we had mentioned previously but we're just going to touch about them right here. Uh, so the infratemporal fossa contains the pterygoid muscles both the medial and lateral as well as the masseter muscle that kind of forms uh, one of the borders of the IT fossa. Uh, so a lot of these muscles are very important based on the anatomical relationship with things like the arteries and the nerves um, and the neurovascular structures as a whole. Other than that, they just said their only importance is in uh, muscles of mastication, which we'll be discussed on further in the musculature of head chapter. So now we're going to touch upon a uh, clinical pearl here in, in regards to the infratemporal fossa. So the temporomandibular joint uh, is a very very complicated joint, especially when you're talking about oral surgery and uh, muscle mastications and a lot of phonation and, and uh, facial movement. 
the difficult part about here is that it's such close proximity to a lot of neurovascular structures, one of them being the auriculotemporal nerve. Especially during injury to the temp temperament of the joint, whether it's in surgery, isogenically, trauma, you can eventually even injure the auriculotemporal nerve, which if you do, uh, you can actually cause paresthesia to the external ear or to the region supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve. Probably one of the most, more fascinating things in regards to the auriculotemporal nerve is that you can get a syndrome called Frey syndrome. So literally what happens here is during surgery on the parotid gland, you have the auriculotemporal nerve that process, passes in close proximity, um, and what happens is this nerve can be injured and transected. Then what happens is the auriculotemporal nerve may lose its original track and actually re innervate into the parotid gland itself. So instead of the auriculotemporal nerve finding its distal and proximal branches and kind of forming a coaptation between the two, it, the, the, the fibers, the nerve fibers may get lost and insert into the parotid gland. When this happens, any sort of stimulus provided just the parotid gland, like you, your, your mouth salivates when you see food, you can actually start to get some sort of like sensory innervations to the area of the rickle temporal nerve. So you can get things like scalp sweating, you can get chewing or oral cavity can stimulate this, this feeling of erythema and flushing on, on the, in the area by your, your auricular temporal region. It's a fascinating syndrome and it's pretty cool if you're coming across it clinically. I mean, I assume it's probably very rare. I don't actually know the, the prevalence of this, but it's something that can be tested upon, especially in, a, in an examination or pimped on because of the fact that it's such a, almost like a freak accident that happens when the auricular temporal nerve has ectopic re into the parotid gland. And that concludes the Vinci Academy's chapter here on the infratemporal fossa.